So I'm really excited about today and tomorrow. Like I mentioned earlier, those who either weren't online yet or weren't listening, or um, uh, this is for the recording's sake, uh, tomorrow is Shavuot, and um, this is our Omer counting calendar, and we've counted 49 days, by the way, seven weeks, seven complete Sabbaths. So number seven, obviously, is a biblical number. It comes up all over the place. And so seven times seven is 49, and then plus one brings us to tomorrow, which is the 50th day of the counting of the Omer. It's June 5th this year, and uh, I'm excited about that. And, and, I'm, and you might be wondering, why did God decide to pour out his spirit on all mankind? The fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. Hundreds of years later, prophesied and beginning probably 1,500 years before that at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 when God gave the Torah, why did he choose this holiday that was initiated in Leviticus 23? You know, the Jews have been celebrating Shavuot since then. But something happened in Acts chapter 2 that changed the world forever on this day. So we'll find out more tomorrow about that. But I'm also excited because I'm, I feel like we're on the verge of a great revival. A, a, a great turnaround, for not only for our nation, but the whole world. Why do I say that? Well, partially because I can feel it, I can sense it, um, and, and, and I can, I, I, I'm perceiving it as, as a real possibility. Thank you, Jerry. And also because many spiritual leaders are saying the same thing. I mean, if you just turn on the TV or listen to a Christian podcast somewhere, um, people are saying that. Right, Gretchen? Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So momentum is building, which is actually a biblical idea. Some of you have heard me tell stories of Mario Murillo. Um, he had, he's had a number of... Uh, by, the way, by the way, we remember Mario from the 1970s, the mid-70s, when he was doing these outreaches, because we, we lived in the Bay Area, these outreaches in the Oakland, uh, Oakland theaters, Oakland Center theaters, Oakland, I don't remember exactly the name of it, in Oakland, and, and thousands of young people would, would go there, and I'd go with my long hair and my overalls, you know, and, and they'd have, he'd have the best Christian bands. I remember the one, one night, the second chapter of Acts was just rocking out the whole room, you know. And then, and then he'd have these, these prophetic words of, of people would have some be, be, be ill or would be sick with some ailment or some disease, and, and he would point them out, and they'd come up on stage, and they would get healed. I mean, we're talking about all the time. And this was the Jesus movement, you know. And Mario has been having these outreaches, the one in Bakersfield, California, of all places. I mean, does anyone ever know, anyone know where Bakersfield is? A few of you? Yeah, if you've been down in Southern California... It's on the verge of the Mojave Desert. And then, and then lately he had one a couple months ago in outside of Buffalo, New York, in a little, little farming village. And I remember seeing the video of the cars that were lined up for five or six miles trying to get into the tent. They could only hold 3,000 people, and they packed out the tent, and then people were just standing out in the fields in the rain, getting wet. And there's something going on. And we want to be not only aware of it, but be connected to it. And so if you live in a bubble, you're not going to be connected to anything except yourself. So we need to get out of our bubbles, if you will. So this building momentum is, is a biblical idea because God wants to move and he expects us, he He. He expects us to expect something to happen. And we want to see him move. Sure, God can do whatever he pleases, but when we're waiting, when we're tarrying for the Spirit of God to move, then we're, we're, we're poised for that to happen. We're ready for God to do something. I'm, I'm, in other words, I'm, al I'm always looking, for instance, I'm always looking for some way to witness to somebody. I'm looking for some opening, a word, um, a glance, um, 
something, you know, maybe they're wearing something around their neck or they've got a t-shirt on and some, some way to open a conversation where I can talk about the Lord. And other times I just, I've been in at QFC or over here in Newcastle and I, I just sensed that the cashier needed some prayer and at, as she was done cashing me out I said, um, is there anything I could pray for you about? And she just froze said, well, actually there is. And she told me, and I didn't pray for her right then. There were customers in line, but they heard the conversation. I said, I will be praying for you. you know? So why do I say we're on the verge of a great revival? Because most, if not all, historic revivals occurred during a difficult time in history, during um, social unrest and and um, racial divide, and class distinctions, and, and crime, and lawlessness, which, should all, which could also be translated Torahlessness, by the way. And there was a basic turning away from God in unrighteousness. And, and out of these difficult times, major historical revivals broke out. Now some of you know I'm a, I'm a student of revival, I've got a, a revival library. I've read lots of books. I, I could just pick them up at any time and be, be encouraged. You want to be encouraged? Yeah. Read some stuff about the historic revivals. Amen. You'll be very encouraged. And you'll be excited as well. Right, Gretchen? Yeah. So you've probably heard me speak about the Wesleyan revival in England in the 1700, 17th century. I've spoken about Count Zinzendorf and the Moravians out of Herrenhut, Germany, uh, of the 1906 Azusa Street Revival. I've mentioned many times, and William Seymour, and how that all came about. It's very interesting. And more. The Latter Rain Revival in Saskatchewan in 1948. There was the, the Hebrides Revival, early 1900s. But today I want to share for a few minutes about the, the Welsh Revival, 1904, 1905 in Wales. Um, it was a visitation of the Holy Spirit that was felt everywhere. Not just in religious circles, but in secular circles. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. And it was, a, it, was, it was revival where God poured out his presence on everybody. I'm going to quote from a number of different sources. I've sort of put it all, all together. The services were full, packed to the brim with people hungry to receive from the Lord. The Welsh loved to sing. Bob. The Welsh loved to sing. And, th and this revival was called the singing revival. Yeah. We love to sing. Yeah. I know some people come and we do a couple songs at the beginning. We do a few announcements. We do this midrash teaching, open up the Torah scroll. And then people think we're done, you know. They get ready to walk out. They say, wait a minute, where are you going? The Bible College of Wales reported, the singing would segue into intercession as loud cries of mercy rose to heaven like incense. All over the country, testimonies of hardened souls receiving salvation and lives being changed were heard. The impact of the Lord's hand was evident. Stories of courts abandoned due to a lack of crime and bars shutting down were commonplace. Entertainment such as football matches, lat, which is probably soccer, lacked attendance as people were so hungry for his presence. Sales of pocket testaments were snapped up as people hungered for the bread of life. The great turning point in Evan Roberts' life was when he heard the evangelist, evangelist Seth Joshua pray, Lord, bend us. And the words stuck to his heart and mind. The Holy Spirit said to Evan, that's what you need. He knew he had to consecrate himself to God before the Spirit would come through his ministry. The next day, he felt as if he, he was bursting inside in the chapel meeting. I felt a living power pervading my bosom. It took my breath away, and my legs trembled exceedingly. The living, 
power became stronger and stronger as each one prayed until I felt it would tear me apart. I fell on my knees with my arms over the seat in front of me. My face was bathed in perspiration, and the tears flowed in streams. I cried out, bend me, bend me. It was God's compending love which bent me. What a wave of peace flooded my bosom. I was filled with compassion for those who must bend at the judgment. And I wept following Following that, the salvation of the human soul was solemnly impressed on me. I felt ablaze with the desire to go through the length and breadth of Wales to tell of the Savior. So, Evan Roberts was filled with the Holy Spirit, with a burden to reach his countrymen. He was touched personally as God bent him. He was conformed more into the image of Messiah, and his life would never be the same. But this burden was to communicate the love of God and the message of the gospel to everyone he met. It was personal, but it was also corporate. We're singing this song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you welcome here. The revival started in the south and a few days later broke out into the north. Within a few weeks, it, it had spread to all parts of Wales like a prairie fire. People began to flock to church buildings. Sometimes all the churches in one town would be filled with people for up to 24 hours a day. In some places, there was preaching. In others, there was just singing. And then there were testimonies. In still others, just people being led to pray out loud. The national employment of Wales was primarily in the coal mines. These were places of terrible ungodliness with much swearing, blaspheming, and gambling. But now, services were held hundreds of feet under the earth. Sometimes 300 men would gather to hear the reading of Scripture, sing hymns, and offer prayers. The horses in the coal mines were confused because they had been driven by men using profanity and kicks. But those disappeared. The horses had to learn a new language. Which to me, is, is, it sounds funny, silly, simple. To me, it's really profound. Because the people, the workers, the men in the mind had changed. There's another story of uh, uh, George Whitfield preaching in Bristol in England. During the Wesleyan, right before the Wesleyan revival broke out, and he was preaching to coal miners. And he, there were so many coal miners getting saved, he called for John Wesley in London to come and help him. So John, an Anglican priest, Anglican pastor, really, he prayed about it because it was against the Anglican rules to preach outside the church. So he went to Bristol, and he preached in what he called the open air. Sounds funny to us, doesn't it? Churches have traditions and have liturgy and have things that they just do year after year after year that can hamper the Holy Spirit. And he went. He said he preached to 10,000 coal miners and they were getting saved all over the place. Of the, of, the, of the revival's results, I'm still quoting, one of the most marvelous effects was upon the courts of justice throughout Wales. Criminal calendars were reduced to a minimum. Lists of convictions dwindled to nothing. Judges had, instead of the usual long list of cases awaiting trial, blank sheets of paper without a single name. One newspaper report said, Truly, God has visited his people in Wales. 
It is not a question of one town being awakened, but the whole principality being lit on fire. Police courts are idle, family feuds pacified, old standing debts paid, the family altar re-erected, and Bible study has become a passion. This is the finger of God. Not only does it hold a large place in the religious weeklies, but the chief Cardiff journals give columns to the revival each day, and some of the principal London papers give a full column every morning. This is what was happening um, in Los Angeles in the uh, mid-1920s and 1930s when Emmy Sample McPherson uh, built Angelus Temple, and, uh, which was the first four-square church, and people were getting healed. The, the, they had a special ambulance driveway, and when someone was in an accident or hurt, they would give the person the option, the hospital or Angelus Temple. I've been there. I've seen it. They had a room full of crutches and and, and, and braces, or polio braces, and, and um, gurneys of people who have been brought in who walked out. And the papers were recording what was going on. But of all, above all, there were the converts. After a few weeks of the Welsh revival, there were 10,000. And after a couple months, there were 30,000. With, within six months... There were over 70,000, and after nine months, the figure left over 100,000 new believers sold out for God. In nine months. The Welsh Revival was soon the main topic of conversation throughout the Christian world. Wherever the news went, it seemed to cause passionate prayer and began to ignite revival fires everywhere. And that's partially why I'm, I'm giving you this information, because I'm hoping revival fires will be birth in you as an individual, and then it'll, it'll spread to your circle of influence. And right here at Bay Tikva, I can't make anything happen. You can want it, and then wait and see what the Holy Spirit does. Christians across Great Britain turned to prayer, and church membership increased throughout the land. In Scandinavia, a current revival was fanned into a mighty blaze as a result of the Welsh revival. Germany was similarly affected as the flames spread across Europe. Austria, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, the Balkans, and Russia all experienced awakenings. The United States felt the aftershock of the Welsh revival in almost every place. Prayer, conviction, and conversion spontaneously occurred, resulting in unusual church growth. In 1906, the modern Pentecostal movement was born on Azusa Street in Los Angeles after a succession of local revivals throughout the year 1905. News of the Welsh revival had encouraged more prayer, and suddenly the Holy Spirit descended. Daily meetings were held for the next three years. Visitors flocked there to catch the power of the Spirit, and they were not disappointed. No one could have imagined that this was the beginning of the greatest and most effective missionary movement the world had ever seen. Almost no country in the world was excluded from the effects of this incredible revival. Almost every nation on every continent received new power from heaven and a new passion for prayer and the lost. Hundreds of thousands came to the Lord. Last quote. Of this revival, Reverend W.T. Steed remarked, hitherto the revival has not strayed beyond the track of singing people. It has followed the line of song, not of preaching. It has sung its way from one end of South Wales to the other, but then the Welsh are a nation of singing birds. Here was revival, led not so much by the preaching of man, but by the Spirit of God, lavishly poured out on all flesh. There were also no advertisements, no posters, no huge tents. Yet, throngs of people flocked to church meetings to experience firsthand the mighty outpouring of God's presence. Many people were baptized with the Holy Spirit, 
Over the course of less than a year, the Lord moved in Wales and the rest of the UK, capturing tens and hundreds of thousands of souls for the kingdom of God. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for these stories. I'm just touching on them this morning. There's so many. God, we want to be ready for a move of your spirit. We want to be like the disciples in the upper room waiting expectantly, tarrying, uh, expecting you to do something, expecting you to move, expecting you to fill us, and then use us to reach the world with your good news and with your love. In Yeshua's name, hallelujah. As I watch what's happening in our country, I, I see so many similarities to what I personally experienced in the 60s and 70s. Social unrest. I lived in L.A. during the Watts riots. You could see the smoke from my house of the burning buildings. 1964, I think it was, or five. The assassinations of Robert Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, shut down Columbia University. Herbert Marcuse and the rise of American Marxism. Angela Davis and the Black Panthers. Vietnam War protests and draft dodgers. Mario Savio and the free speech movement. The Weather Underground. Watergate. Mistrust of our government. The 1968 riots at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Widespread drug use, especially psychedelics, marijuana, LSD, and amphetamines. There was the Hong Kong flu, which killed an estimated 2 million worldwide. There were gas lines and skyrocketing inflation in the 1970s. And I could go on. Does any of this sound familiar? It's like we're right back where we were. But what seemed to be a huge black hole of depravity and sin and lawlessness birthed one of the greatest revivals of all time. The charismatic revival. The Jesus movement. Hundreds of thousands of mostly young people, some say over a million, found meaning and purpose as they confessed their sin, repented, and experienced the joy that comes from knowing God in a personal way. And that was a big deal for, for me anyway, because God was somewhere out there. But I was told, thank you, Francis and Edith Schaefer, that, that God was not only infinite, but personal. It changed my life. Rita and I were part of that movement. We're, we're, we don't know why or how, but we were alive then, and God allowed us to be a part. In fact, in August, uh, uh, June, July, in two months, we're going, almost exactly, we're going down to California um, for about a week for the 50th anniversary <clears throat> the 50th anniversary celebration of the, the churches that we started in 1972. 50 years this August. And I'd say most of them are still going, which is a miracle. So we're going to have, we're going to see people we haven't seen in a long, long time. But that was, that was the charismatic revival, the Jesus movement. I remember the first time I walked into this church, 1975, and I had my overalls and my long hair and my Birkenstocks before anybody even knew about Birkenstocks. We were so cool, you know. <clears throat> I had a, a big purple velvet heart that I had sewn onto my right buttock, and I walked in there, and there was these people, I've said this before, there's these people, they were singing this song, Spring up a well within my soul. And they were jumping up in the air. I thought, 
These are a bunch of weird people. I'm never jumping in the air, right? You know, it's been, I don't know how long it took me, but I was jumping with the best of them. Because God was moving powerfully back in those days. I remember the time I cut my hair and, and we were sitting on a, we had a picnic, the church was having a picnic, and Rita was on one step sitting next to a friend talking, and I was a couple steps down. The lady said, so where's Highland? And she goes, well, he's, he's right here. Like, I, was, I was right next to them. She looked at me because I had short hair and I had shaved my beard and, and she was in shock. Later, she actually asked me to forgive her because she had been judging me all those years with my long hair. No, oh, about a year. We were looking for universal truth. We found it in the truth. The way, the truth, the life. We didn't know the truth would be a person. And his name was Jesus. His name is Jesus. But we prefer Yeshua, his Hebrew name, which actually means salvation. Many Pentecostal churches experienced revival fires akin to Wales and Azusa Street during this revival. Could it be that we are on the precipice of another great move of God? Amen. We know we need it. Yes. We know it seems like it's hopeless out there, and every time I turn on the TV, I want to turn it off again because something else is being done to rip away from our freedoms or to coerce us or have government control. Did you hear recently that, that, that Canada has passed an amendment, they're banning all handguns. It's going to go into effect, I forgot when, uh, soon. And that's what our government's trying to do as well. Trying to rip apart our Constitution. I don't want to get lost in that. We need another revival. A great awakening, a return to God. Amen. And the wor I believe the world is ripe for something big. Yep. Yeshua said in Matthew 24, verse 37, the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. And the days of Noah are described in Genesis 6, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. One of the, one of the, one of the verses I hate the most in the Bible, I have a, there's a few of them. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Oh my gosh. The flood affected the whole earth. Listen, COVID-19 has affected the whole earth. Are we in the days of Noah? Are these the birth pangs that will usher in the Messiah, the coming of the Son of Man? What's happening in the world around us could make us depressed, make us feel weary, make us feel like giving up, make us feel like moving to another state, which I know some of you are thinking about or have thought about, and you have friends who've already moved. I have I have some friends who moved to Coeur d'Alene last year, and I was talking with them about a month ago, and uh, he said, well, maybe you want to talk to my realtor. She can help you because she's helped all the other refugees that have fled Washington. <laughs> we heard a story. Uh, a friend of ours was in a restaurant in Coeur d'Alene, and the... Um, and the server walked up to them, they're serving them, and, and she said to them, um, are you from out of state? And she said, well, how'd you know? She said, the last eight tables I've waited on have moved from another state to Coeur d'Alene. We could feel like getting out, too. We could, maybe, maybe some of you feel overwhelmed by what's happening. Thankfully, 
we can be we can be assured that God is trustworthy to carry us through. No matter how bleak the news headlines, we hold on to the hope of healing and a future that only God can make possible. He is secure. He is the eternal anchor for our souls. If our ultimate hope was in people or in, in anything that this world had to offer, we would be lost and hopeless. But our hope is in Yeshua the Messiah, Amen. who triumphed over sin and death and set us on a firm foundation and provides eternal life for all those who believe in him and trust him. In fact, if you, if you receive him, he gives you the authority to be called children of God. When fear and discouragement start to wear you down, remember how great our God is. He is trustworthy. By the way, I've said this for years, now I have to apply it to my own life. You know, when you point, there's three fingers pointing back at you. I've told people, you don't move to another place because it's beautiful there or because you like the weather or you like the people, or you can afford it. You move because God tells you to move. And any other reason just doesn't cut it. Right, John? <laughs> John's going like this. God is faithful and wise. And trustworthy, and has good plans for you that no one can thwart. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's read that one together. You ready? Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm, God knows we need this today. Many times Yeshua spoke and emphasized the subject of harvest, saying the fields are, are white for harvest, the fields are, are ready for harvest. He said to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the fields, for the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You've heard that. Some of you have heard that hundreds of times good missionary scripture, right? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Shavuot in Jerusalem was the beginning of the spiritual harvest that God was starting to gather among his first fruits, among the first Jewish believers, the first Messianic Jews, and it would spread all over the world. Yeshua said the harvest is great, and that was 2,000 years ago. The harvest is even greater today. Yeah. Think about it. Lord, Lord, Lord we want to care about what you care about. The revival is on the top of your list. Yeah. Revival for the Jewish people, revival for the Gentiles, and that's the whole world. In fact, it says in Romans 11, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and then all Israel will be saved. That's worldwide revival. We're almost done. Fifty days after the first Passover in Egypt came the first Shavuot in the wilderness. And God poured out his spirit upon the Israelites when he, he gave them the Torah. And some of you know the story in Exodus 19 and, and the mountain shook and there was fire on top and smoke and all of you were afraid and said, Moses, you go. We're staying down here. And then they heard a shofar, a loud shofar blast and then the, it said it got louder and louder. I don't know how loud it was, but it must have been ear piercing if, if, it, was, if it was already loud to begin with. And then God spoke these words. And tomorrow we're going to read Exodus 
21 through 18 or whatever it is, uh, what we call the Ten Commandments. They're not called the Ten Commandments in Scripture, by the way. They're called the Aserat um, Devarim, the Ten Words. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Fast forward about 1,500 years, and we get to Yeshua's last Passover. His last Passover Seder. And we jump forward to his death, burial, and resurrection when the blood of the Lamb was applied on the lintel and doorposts of the hearts of men and women. And for 50 days after the resurrection, if you came here last week, I preached on the resurrection appearances of Yeshua. I'd never done that before in one message. So I gave you all the appearances and what happened during those 40 days that he walked with them. And after 40 days, he said, now wait in Jerusalem. Something's going to happen. And they anticipated the coming of the Messiah. Our worship team still here somewhere? I'm looking for Daniel. Ah. So right before he ascended to heaven, Yeshua told them to wait, to tarry. For what the Father had promised, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What in the world did that mean? Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if the risen Savior told you that? And he said now to wait in Jerusalem? You had no thought of leaving Jerusalem. Wait in Jerusalem, the risen one. Okay, whatever you say. John baptized with water. Well, they all knew that. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from, from now. And with fire? I think it does say and with fire. Okay, Acts 1. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Not with fire. There's another place where he says that with fire. I forgot where that is. It doesn't matter. Look it up yourself. Um, so there, listen, and I am almost done. Their anticipation was high. Their expectation must have been off the charts. Look, tomorrow is Shavuot, also known as Chag HaKatsir, which is the, the Feast of the Harvest. Did you know that? So, we, so what a perfect holiday to outpour the Holy Spirit, to baptize them in the Holy Spirit, because this is all about the harvest and bringing souls in. And what happened? How many got saved? 3,000. A few days in one day. A few, a few days later, 5,000. We're talking about this, the early Messianic community was exploding in Jerusalem and spread all over the country. Here's my question for you. Are you ready for another outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Amen. Are you ready for revival? A harvest of souls? Are you ready to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit? When Evan Roberts was filled with the Holy Spirit, he said, I fell on my knees with my arms over the seat in front of me. My face was bathed in perspiration and the tears flowed in streams. I cried out, bend me, bend me. It was God's commending love which bent me. What a wave of peace flooded my bosom. Let's pray. Hallelujah. You want more of God? Bend me. You have some hidden sin? Bend me. Are you rebellious in any way? Bend me. 
you have a pornography problem, bend me. You have a broken relationship that you can change. Bend me. Cry out to God. Bend me. And you'll come and he'll take the stiffness out of your life. Maybe you're stubborn. Say, Lord, bend me. Maybe you're stiff-necked. Say, Lord, bend me. Maybe you're narcissistic and you think about yourself more than others. Say, Lord, bend me. Maybe you're not serving anywhere. You're just living for yourself and there's places you could be serving the living God. Maybe here at Beit Tikva, bend me. He was saying, conform me to your image, O oh God. Let the love of God Fill you afresh. God, please. We need you, Lord. The governments of the world need you. We really need revival. It starts with us. Each individual right here listening to this message. It starts with us. As we close, if anybody wants prayer, you can just come up here and some of our prayer team will come up and pray with you. When I rededicated my life to the Lord in 1975, I got baptized in water in 1976 and then soon after baptized in the Holy Spirit. People were praying in tongues during this revival. That was one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit during this charismatic revival. And, and I wanted that for myself. I read 1 Corinthians 14. The Apostle Paul said, I wish you all spoke in tongues. I go, oh yeah? Well, I'd like to. I wish you all. Okay. I, I wish me all too. I want to speak in tongues. But I wasn't. And people prayed for me and laid hands on me and nothing happened and nothing happened for weeks and weeks at a time. And finally, someone said, just go off alone somewhere. And I went on a hike up a mountainside. I got far enough up, but there was nobody around. And someone said, but you got, you got to say something. God won't pry your mouth open. And so I just started praising him. And out of my mouth came a language I had never heard before. And I was, I was as surprised as anybody would have been. And all I remember, it was so beautiful, I didn't want it to stop. And my prayer was, and still has been, God, I want all that you want for me. And if tongues is a part of it, so be it. You know, there's a lot of gifts of the Holy Spirit. Tongues is only one of them. A couple years ago, I preached a whole series on the gifts of the Spirit from 1 Corinthians 12. You can hear it on our website. So we're going to sing this song that I kind of, I didn't butcher it earlier, but I just kind of hummed a few 